So before this video begins, I think it's important to lay out the foundation of what it's gonna be all about. My YouTube channel is dedicated primarily to the focus and attention of what it's like to be an emerging artist. I want to give you a little bit of the insight into what it's like for me, as well as my connection with others, talk about my experiences, my successes, my failures, the tools, the things I went right, the things I went wrong, my progress as well. And so what I've been doing lately is doing these Instagram live videos. And what I love about it is that it's instantaneous. People can ask me questions and I can answer them right away. There's no emails, there's no writing long uh, messages and repeating the same information over and over again. I just get to hear a question, or see a question, read it, respond to it, and then move on to the next one. This is a long form video. This is an hour long video. What does that mean? This is kind of like what a podcast is about. It's an interview, it's a conversation. It's a discussion that doesn't really have a beginning and an end. It's just a free floating conversation. The conversations sometimes are specific. Sometimes they start off as a question which evolves into another question and it's a back and forth banter. Sometimes the questions range on a broad variety of subjects, but all in all, it's always around the subject of creativity, of what it means to be an artist, how to get your work out there, how to make sales, how to connect with an audience, and how to really design a lifestyle around the things that you care about. So, before I begin with this video, I wanna let you know that it is an Instagram Live video, so the video will be vertical in the middle and black on both sides. Um, it's the only way that I could put it into this video. I always read out loud the question that is being um, asked. That way you can have an idea of what, I, what it is I'm talking about. But what I really wanna talk to you about is the intention of this video. The purpose of it is it's an opportunity for you to get insight into my life, into my world, and into the things that I care about and how these things may also apply to you and your journey. What I love about long form conversations is that I get to really engage, I get to really absorb knowledge and really get to see the trajectory of what it's like to be this person. I love hearing about people that are authors, people that are painters, people that are photographers, videographers, writers, actors. And so this is simply one focus primarily on what it's like to be an artist. And in my case, an oil painter. So some of these things may apply to you, but in many ways, it's not about what it is you do, it's how you do it. It's the approach. So when I say I'm an artist, this is how I make art, you could literally replace that with any other job description or creative practice. And something in those conversations will be able to be applied to you and your journey and your trajectory in whatever creative pursuit that you have. So what I typically suggest with these videos is that you, you know, pull up a chair, join me on this ride, keep your ears open, but you don't necessarily need to keep your eyes on the video. Some people like to watch, that's cool, if you're into that, just kidding. Um, but if you if you're have projects to do, if you have homework to do, if you are currently working on a drawing or a painting or something that you have maybe set aside for too long, Maybe it's time to pull that out, put it out on the table, put all your soldiers in a line, set up that lighting, get into the zone, play one of my videos, and listen in. And if this thing is for you, then stay tuned because there'll be many more Instagram Live videos uploaded in long uh, format. But I think this one is especially important because I talk about a lot of subjects that are very sensitive, that are maybe not outwardly spoken about or not shared as transparently as much as it could be. I talk about what it means to be an artist and struggle with depression. I talk about what it's like to price your work and how to come up with a price. I talk about what it's like to be an artist in the beginning without a creative audience and how to move past those rough points in the beginning. I talk about the importance of making the practice be the priority in everything and how there's a misconception of having a purpose and just having a priority in your life where that becomes the center of what everything else revolves around. 
I know this is a really long introduction, but I feel like it's the only way to start this video so that you have a better understanding of what it is I'm gonna talk about, what this video can do for you, and how this can in many ways be beneficial to you and your practice. So take a seat, um, pull out your sketchbook, pull out your notepad. If you're a writer, do your thing. If uh, you're editing uh, photos online, perfect. If you're a photographer, I think this could be great. This is a hour long video. Watch whatever you prefer, skip if you must. But I think that if you just sit tight and let the conversation flow, you'll end up hearing something that could help you. Um, and a lot of things that I talk about in these videos, these are things that I wish I had known when I was just starting out. These are things that I wish I could have learned without having to have made the mistake myself. But because I've lived these things, because I've experienced these things firsthand, I can now bring back these findings and share with you. So here it goes, here's my Instagram live video. Hey guys, welcome back to another live video. My name is Bo Bernay Frank and I'm a 25 year old painter based out of Pacific Grove here on the California coast. I honestly haven't done a live video in probably a couple weeks. Uh, life has been really busy, primarily with work and with painting. Um, I've gotten this really big rush of energy and I just can't seem to get rid of it. And so I've just been directing it to the canvas, directing it to the studio and just busting out piece after piece. And I, it's amazing what happens when, you know, you find like a path or a current and you jump on it and you just let it ride. Um, it just takes you to these really cool places and trying to understand what is that's happening inside with what's happening outside and then connecting it through a narrative and connecting it through the canvas and oil paints. So that's kind of been the journey of the last few years. Um, and lately it's been all about abstract, all about water. And I, I don't really know exactly 100% why, but it's captured my attention. And I think I'm gonna stick with it for a little bit and see what happens next. Um, just to give you a little update on the latest, uh, the last couple of months have been pretty wild. Um, I've been spending a lot more time than usual on art and it's been paying off. I've been doing a lot more sales. I've been getting a lot more commissions. Um, I've been creating artwork that I really resonate with or that I enjoy really making um, on a daily basis. And so sometimes with painting, it's it can be tiresome. It can be... Um, energy draining instead of you know something that gets you up and going and excited um, but lately it's been something that I just can't seem to get enough of and I'm really enjoying this kind of smaller form format it's been uh, it's been a great way to just do quick sales it's kind of more relaxed it's less pressure it's less stress and it's just you know a little six inch by six inch so I I've been working on a couple projects. I have the projects, which is um, the six by six auction. It's a page that I started not too long ago and it's all only dedicated to six inch uh, by six inch format on wood panels. The, the content is typically water, but I wanna definitely branch out one day and do landscapes, portraiture, abstract, whatever feels right in the moment. These six inch by six inches, they're not really, made for the gallery system because the gallery system ends up taking such a huge cut. So when a sale is made through a gallery for a smaller piece, it's almost um, not worth it. But when it's sold directly to a client, all that money that would have gone to the gallery stays in your pocket and it allows you to continue making the work that you want to make. So the gallery system I think is still amazing, don't get me wrong. I just think that that's more set up for larger, larger set pieces and pieces that have a higher price point. Um, the benefit of these little smaller pieces is that everyone can participate, everyone can own a piece. Um, most people have $100 in the bank account or they have 150, 200, 250, 300, whatever. Uh, it's something that's definitely much more approachable than something that's $5,000 or $4,000 or $2,000. Like, you know, just because I'm working and making money, like I do have savings, but can I really afford to drop $3,000 on a piece of art? It's probably not the right time. Um, but something that's more approachable, definitely. 
so yeah, um, I started collecting artwork from other people and that's kind of a cool new avenue. Um, I purchased a piece by Caleb Hahn that was $1,400. That's probably the most expensive art piece that I've ever purchased, but it's an amazing piece and I'm so glad I got it. Um, I'm really excited to have it framed and hang up in my studio. And then today I just bought a new piece, which is a smaller piece by Graham Arrington, I think is his last name. And uh, it was just a piece that I really connected with. So the whole idea of like being an artist and sharing work and having people support it, I was feeling very selfish in that endeavor. And so I thought, why not do the same and reciprocate? Why not get to connect with other artists and befriend them? And what better way to do it than to actually support their work? So yeah, my goal is to start collecting art and especially art that speaks to me, that resonates with me, that makes me feel like, feel something, whatever that may be. It doesn't always have to be happy. Um, it can be sad, it can be intuitive, it can be, you know, a, a memento for a moment in time. I think that's what's so wonderful about art is that it's all your own interpretation. You take, you take away what you want from the piece. Um, so yeah, why am I here on Instagram Live? Uh, typically what happens is I get to talk about art, which is something that's so rare. Um, I know it is like, I know I'm an artist. I know I share a lot of things about art, but I typically don't get to talk about it. So if there's anybody out there who's also an artist, if there's anybody out there that wants to talk about art, if you have any questions regarding what it's like to be an artist, or if you just want to know more about my process or tools or anything that might be helpful or useful to you, I'd be more than happy to answer those questions. So yeah, I usually leave the floor open to questioning um, and it can be anything you like really. So uh, let me just scroll through and see if there's any questions. I know I've just been talking, so I'll try and be quiet. <laughs> um, side note though, I am starting up the six by six auction website. I just have to figure out the back end of things when it comes to like the software and having people register and sign in so that they can start placing bids. Um, using Instagram has been great because it's very instantaneous, but there are issues with the timing in terms of when the auction closes. It's all manual rather than automatic. So that's why I'm currently creating that website. Um, and yeah, the, the fun thing about these quick sales is that these auctions have actually led to further purchase, uh, further sales from other people wanting to just buy art directly. Um, so I've literally sold $1,500 in the last uh, week and a half, which is pretty cool. And um, the last two months I've made more for my art than I have for my day job. So that gives me hope that art is something that I can definitely sustain long term. It's something that I can cultivate and spend my time with and really improve my craft, really produce work that resonates with me and others, and just spend my life being me all the time, which just so happens to be an artist. Uh, yeah, and I have, I landed a couple really big commissions, which literally could sustain me for a couple months. So planning around those things, organizing that, and then also continuing the series of portraits and then starting up the series of rounds. So that's gonna be a fun, fun little side project. How do you price your art? Yeah, so this is something that's very personal. It's like, there is no right or wrong way when it comes to doing this. Um, typically when you're just starting out, the whole idea is to just find some kind of source of income a lot of people want to overprice their work and then there's the other side of things where people want to underprice their work. I see a lot of really talented artists out there that are just like giving away their art for really low numbers and I'm like, ugh, my heart. But maybe they're doing that because they just want to sell in bulk and so they'd rather sell, 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 sell rather than hold on to them and sell them for higher price points um, just to generate income. So it's like if your goal is to sell the art for the price that you think is valuable for, don't lower the price to something that isn't up to your standard. But if your intention is to just move artwork out of the studio and make room for a new place for art to sit and kind of, you know, linger until it's purchased by somebody, then I would say, sure, you can lower the price or keep it at the price that you think. And if it doesn't sell for a year, two years, three years, it doesn't really matter because you're not losing money. 
And then when it does sell and it sells for the actual price that you want, you get to actually make what you think that piece was valued for. So there's certain art pieces that I've made four years ago that haven't sold yet, but I know deep down inside their value. And I know that maybe right now I haven't found the right client for that piece, but one day they will show up and they will definitely pay the premium price because from having spent enough time, I feel like I know more or less the value of my art. That might change, that might evolve, the price might lower, the price might go up, but I feel like I have no necessity to have to sell a work for a lower price just to be able to make ends meet. So that's how I price my art. <laughs> um, when is the moment that an artist knows he is great? Unlike sports, there is no stat associated with quality other than price. I would definitely not consider myself a great artist. I would say I am an emerging artist or I am simply an artist, that's it. Um, I think uh, the, the whole concept of like putting a title to yourself is kind of ridiculous. Um, it's hard to judge that. And especially when it's based on outside judgment I think the value that you get from yourself in terms of how you see yourself as an artist or how you see yourself as a creative, that comes through the practice. I think, especially in the beginning when you're just starting out, like you're just trying to understand how to maneuver these products, how to move your brush in such a way, how to capture something that was originally just a vision or a concept on a napkin or in your journal, you know, a couple of scribbles on a piece of paper the the journey of taking those ideas and converting it into a physical product and then figuring out a way to then put it in front of a client and sell it that is a very zigzag route and especially in the beginning it's hard to make that practice convert into dollar bill signs but the practice is the fir first and foremost the most important part it's the only thing that will get you to the dollar bill signs down the road just being okay with not being seen, being okay with not being admired, being okay with not producing the best quality content or comparing yourself to other people who have been doing it for much longer and being like, yeah, my work is shit. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's nothing to be ashamed about. That's just part of the program. Um, I guess when you know that you've made it or that you're, you're great is when people just can't ignore you like you you create the work and whether you're known or whether you're a you know total rando if people stop and appreciate it or you know say comments and they're not your mom or they're not your best friend or whatever then typically there's something that you're onto it and also like art is so subjective so what's to someone is like the most amazing piece of art to someone is garbage and is useless so I wouldn't say don't listen too much to the outside voices, but also take it into consideration. Uh, just look at all the factors. Um, look at how much time you've spent on it. Look at how much um, interest there is. Look at what needs to be improved on and then just focus your attention on improvement. Uh, do you have any tips for an artist who wants to inspire people? What are some ways to get a message across other than painting itself? Um, I think what's so great about humans is that we're really creative storytellers. Like the story itself is important, you know, like the narrative is important, but it's not so much the story, it's how the story is told. That is something that currently right now is really in a really cool kind of metamorphosis where it's like we're branching out stories from just being on paper to being visual, like very visual, like movies and um, photography, like being able to document your process and not just share the work, but how the work was made or the intention behind it. That's a whole other aspect that wasn't really ever revealed in the past. It was like something that was safeguarded primarily in schools, um, primarily in very small circles. Now everything is being shared, everything is kind of leveled, and so now you have access to everybody, but that doesn't mean that people are actually gonna listen. It doesn't mean that anyone, you know, everyone's gonna care or you know, be interested, but at least you have that opportunity, which is something that people didn't have before. So in terms of like wanting to be inspirational, 
I think that's a valuable, I think that's a kind hearted way of going about it. But I guess the first thing you need to do is inspire yourself, like be an example for yourself, really show up for yourself, do the work that needs to be done, make yourself proud. And I think when you do that, you end up inadvertently attracting people around you and showing that by just being yourself, you actually designed a lifestyle that is pretty freaking cool. Um, yeah, and like, I think, yeah, just sharing, sharing your own process. Just because it's been done before doesn't mean that you don't have something that you can bring to the table. You have a perspective, you have a story, you have a vision, and maybe someone's better than you, maybe someone's been doing it longer than you, but they haven't had the experiences that you've had, so anything that you put out there will still be unique. Um, doesn't mean it'll be good, but it'll be unique. Um, getting good is just the practice part. Uh, do you have a formula for pricing your art? Um, sure. Uh, I'll try and explain how I price my art personally. Um, in large part, it's based upon the clientele. You know, the same piece of art in two galleries is two very different prices. Now it's a little bit different because the world is so connected and so galleries can talk to each other and so what's featured in one place has to be the same price featured in another place. But if one gallery gets people that only have $500 in their pocket and the other gallery has people that have millions of dollars in their pocket, the prices on these pieces can be much higher than the prices in this you know, gallery. Or you keep it the same price and the people that are in this gallery basically can't afford the work that you have and it's just gonna sit there and collect dust. Um, for pricing my work, I guess I price it based on size. It's based on the overall composition, the amount of detail, the amount of soul that's put into it. Like there's some kind of exchange with art where it's like, I dedicate my afternoon to painting. I don't have to do that, but I chose that. And so I put my energy into this thing and I turn something that's basically a blank canvas and I turn it into a work of art. That work of art can take 10 minutes, it can take an hour, it can take 20 hours, it can take 50 hours. The size of the piece definitely dictates the price. So if you spend 200 hours on a little miniature, the price of the miniature still can't really go past a certain point. There's a threshold that it's like, this is where you have to stay within. No one's gonna spend $5,000 on a six inch by six inch unless you have the name, unless you have the renown, unless you have the connections. It just doesn't work that way. But a piece that's 30 by 40 inches, um, that's large, that's intense, that's like your centerpiece, you can charge $6,000 on that and if the right person's in front of it and money isn't an issue, they'll purchase it and they'll take it home with them. The medium sized pieces for me, they typically go for 2,500 to 3,000, which is like 18 by 24. If I sell direct, I keep all the money for myself. If I sell through a gallery, I take 50% or, four, or 60%, depending on the gallery system. Um, the miniatures, I kind of don't really feel this way or that way like i haven't really set prices typically i sell them for 250 to 300 for like a miniature but with the auctions i'm like giving it up to society like you decide the price the highest bidder gets it um sometimes they go higher than i what what i want sometimes they go lower either way i know what i'm signing up for so i'm not let down um and sometimes i'm surprised pleasantly or I'm just surprised. I don't never feel like, oh, that was such a rip off. I lost money from this. It's like, no, like I made money from doing what I love. So whether it was $20 or $100 or $200, it was worth it. Uh, I think you're amazing. Thank you so much. Um, how else do you promote your art? Also, what are some tips to grow your Instagram followers so more people can see your work? Yeah, um, I'm just gonna be shameless and say I literally wrote a 50 page ebook on how to grow your uh, following on Instagram for creatives. It's called Instagram for Creatives. It basically talks about all this that I'm talking about. The longer you stay around, the more information about this I'll share and I share it gladly and I share it freely. But if you want one place that's all compact where it's like 50 pages that's very condensed, um, 
ten dollars is an investment, but it's an investment in your career. I think it would definitely be be beneficial. And there's a lot of things that are like repetitive. It's like everyone kind of has the same ideas, everyone has the same concepts, but it's like the execution. It's the execution that matters. So the way that I treat my Instagram profile is very much the same way that a business treats their profile or a coffee shop or um, a TV personality or whatever. The whole idea is to show who you are, what you're capable of, what it is you're doing, what it is your you hope to do, and what products you have that are available. Now, connecting to a market, that's all about doing the research. It's about promoting your posts, paying for ads, paying you know certain profiles to feature your work, or just networking where people can like send people your way, you send people their way. It's a dance. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but every time you make an investment in yourself, even though the outcome maybe doesn't happen exactly the way that you want, just know that you chose to spend money on something that is helping your business, helping your brand, and every step in that direction leads you to freedom, leads you to sales, and so you have to have those awkward stages, those stages of not making sales, of like investing in yourself and not seeing progress, to then have those breakthroughs and then finally get to those places where you're making money from the things that you love doing. Um, so if you want a condensed place, then yeah, check out my website. Um, it's in my online store, it's 10 bucks. It's a PDF file. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, you are gorgeous dry, that was weird, lol. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How did you get your art in a gallery? I applied to like 75 galleries and I got denied so many times until I didn't get denied. Um, it takes a lot of no's until you get a yes. And honestly, I've been really lazy about it. I'm supposed to send new work and I haven't, which reminds me that I need to do that. Um, I ship my artwork to Australia. That's kind of where I feature my surrealism because I couldn't find a gallery locally that would feature my weird surreal art there just wasn't a market for that or at least there wasn't a gallery that would feature it locally and then i found this gallery in australia we messaged each other they said yeah let's try it out i sent over a couple pieces they sold they said send on some more so i sent another batch i sold a couple pieces and now it's time to send some more and just haven't done it um the gallery that features my landscapes and seascapes that's here locally in big sur I chose to work at this property as a server. That's my primary job. I'm currently trying to transition out, but I am a server. Like money is important. And when the money doesn't come in from the art, I need to make money. Like I still want to travel. I still want to eat well. I still want to pay for the gym. I still want to pay for groceries. Um, I still want to pay for my phone and all that. So um, yeah, I have a job and it's a full-time job and it's very demanding and it takes a lot of hours, but I specifically chose this place in particular because I knew that the property had a gallery space. And so my goal was to A, become a dinner server, which would be the highest income at the property um, as like a normal job. Um, and then two was to feature artwork somewhere on the property. It took six to seven months to get to dinner service. Um, I worked busing for three months, waking up at 5.30, driving an hour, working breakfast, working lunch, and then I pick up food running at night so I could learn the menu at night. Um, eventually, three months later after doing busing, then I moved into lunch service. I was serving tables, learning how to pour wine, how to talk about wine, cocktails, the food, describing the dishes, talking to this clientele. Eventually, I was doing lunch and doing food, runner at, food running at night. I was having like 13 hour days. Eventually they said, hey, someone didn't show up at dinner time. Can you fill in the gap? Can you take some tables? And I was like, of course. And so I started covering shifts, covering shifts. People call in sick, I pick up the shift. Um, eventually I was working so many dinner shifts that they just had to put me on the schedule. So I moved into dinner shifts. Meanwhile, I'm also applying to the gallery. I'm seriously hassling the art curator, nagging them, sending them emails, showing up, you know, unexpectedly and being like, hey, what's up, remember me? Where's my response? Um, and so eventually I just gave up actually. It took like a, after a year of trying to show my art there, I just gave up. And um, 
this entire time I'm still painting, I'm still producing, I'm just not showcasing anywhere locally. And then eventually the art creator was like, hey Bo, what you working on these days? And I just transitioned into this landscape seascape series. And he was like, yeah, I think that we could sell that. Um, bring in what you have and we'll see what we can do. I brought in six pieces, I sold half of them. And so they said, hey, we should have um, a show for you. And so I put together a show and it's currently up on the walls and I sold the painting. Um, and it sold for $5,400. So that's a pretty big number. Um, I have quite a bit more pieces in there as well. I wanna showcase more, but it's kind of a slow season, uh, which can be both good and bad. But yeah, the, the whole idea is like persistence. Like just because you get a no today doesn't mean that it's always gonna be a no. It's the ones that give up too early. Those are the ones that um, miss out on a lot of really great opportunities because sometimes just because you're not a right fit for this place doesn't mean that you're not a right fit for this other place. Um, every time I want to draw, it comes out bad, but when I don't want to draw, it comes out amazing. I love drawing though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes you have good days, sometimes you have bad days. That's just kind of how it is. I'm starting to draw realistic. Do you have any tips to start with? So yeah, for the emerging artist, if you're if you're like me and you're just starting out, I didn't start painting until I was 20, and now I'm 25. Um, I haven't. I've only been drawing painting consistently since 2015, um, and so before that, what I was doing was graphite. It was a lot of ink design. It was a lot of line work. Line work is crucial because it gives you the proportions, which is the bone structure of the piece. It's the foundation. It's the thing that's underneath that gets covered, but is so important for the things that are gonna happen on top of that so that the piece all comes together. So when you go to art school, they put you in drawing classes and you may hate it, but like those drawing classes pay off dividends in the long run. If you're able to capture something through graphite, through line work, that translates beautifully to any medium that you do, whether it's sculpting, whether it's oil painting or acrylic or watercolor or whatever. If you can draw, you can paint. If you can draw, you can do this. Maybe not instantly, but it helps a ton. Um, so when it comes to drawing realistically, people get really confused with perspective. They get really confused with depth um, and proportion. Those are the things I think people struggle the hardest with. Um, shading is kind of something that at first is awkward and comfortable, but then you get the hang of it and you're like, oh, it, you're just capturing the light by deciding how much contrast there is. Um, when it comes to drawing realistically, people get confused and they complicate themselves with the shapes because some things like the human form, there aren't clean lines. They're very weird and they're kind of abstract, but people see hair and what they see is a thousand different lines in their head instead of seeing the basic shapes. So when you draw something, don't think of the thing as what you're seeing, think of it as a shape. So when you look at an eye, you're not thinking of all the individual eyelashes, you're not thinking about the iris, you're not thinking about the details, you're thinking about the basic shape. So it's kind of like, you know, like a, I don't know, like a oval looking thing. And then there's a circle in the middle and then there's a circle inside of it. The nose, it's a bunch of rectangles. There's a bunch of circles in there. Turning your image or reference photo to different angles and comparing it to your own, that helps a lot. Having a mirror behind you where you can look through it and see the opposite reflection, you can tell when something's off. It looks like something's too far to one side, something's too big, proportions are off. There's these little things that you can do, like taking a photo of it and putting it over the actual reference on the computer and being like, wow, how far away am I from the actual, you know, reference point? There's a bunch of little things you can do. Uh, is the six by six auction always just wave paintings? So I did, so um, I took a break from the auctions for a long time and I, I think I just was busy in day to day, -day life. And then I decided to do these abstract waves because I think, yeah, I created this abstract wave collection for Post Ranch for the show. 
And I was like, well, it'd be kind of fun to do just these little warm ups. And these little warm ups turned into these pieces that I was like, I don't know what to do with this. Maybe I should just auction it. So I just started auctioning off these waves and I was like, that's kind of fun. You know, they're, they're abstract, they're different, they're weird, but they're kind of cool. It has a Japanese ink vibe, but then I add in a lot of impasto to the paint, which thickens it up. So there's texture in there and then I dilute the paint. So there's like drips marks and whatever. So these waves have been really fun to paint and I decided to start a Kickstarter project. So I'm doing a Make 100 Surf Studies. And so I started painting these surf studies, but then I also started auctioning them off. So like I paint five and then I'd auction off one. So of the 100 surf studies, I maybe painted 20, but I only have 10 currently in my studio because I've sold the rest. Um, but the goal is to eventually make 100 surf studies and have a Kickstarter and fully get it funded. That's the goal, um, just because I wrote it down in my journal like four years ago and I'm like, I'm gonna freaking do it. Then before I started doing those like little surf studies, I did a lot of ocean seascapes and people really liked that and I really liked it. So I was like, why not make some more? So I've been doing a lot of that. But yeah, I've been putting together this website, which is six by six auction. It's not live yet, so don't go there yet. Um, I'll let you know when it's on. But uh, I, I plan on continuing to do the surf studies. I plan on continuing to do the, the, the seascapes. But eventually, I'm like, these six inch by six inch pieces are my playground. This is where I get to experiment. This is where I get to try something different just because. And if it's terrible, doesn't matter. I'm going to auction it. If it's great, doesn't matter. I'm going to auction it. And so the price that it goes for is the price that it goes for. What this means is that I am given the opportunity to practice something, do something unexpected, do something that I've never done before, learn something, and then what I learn from these pieces, I can apply to my larger pieces, which I feature in galleries, sell directly to clients, yada, yada, yada. But all these little, you know, practice studies, I can earn a living from this. I can also make money from this. So these aren't things that I have to be ashamed of. These aren't things that I have to be afraid of. These are things that maybe somebody else wants. Maybe I don't feel like I want it anymore, but to someone else, it's a work of art. Or to someone else, it's something that makes them happy every day or decorates their bathroom or you know, is right above their desk or in their bedroom. Um, that's why I really like the format. It's just a fun, playful way to try something different and make money from it. <laughs> Um, it is really nice that you show your struggles. Do you sometimes decorate your life to appear ideal on social media or you like to keep it authentic? Like no trace of fantasy. I feel like I'm almost too vulnerable when it comes to social media. I feel like I overshare a lot of the times, which I cringe when I post those things online. I maybe haven't written too much lately, but I, I was in a phase of just like writing my diary online in Instagram where it's like I talk about the bad things, um, the things I'm struggling with. Sometimes it's things that are happening in my personal life because the things that happen in my personal life directly influence the art itself. In many ways, my art is kind of just these little Snapchat, like little snapshots of different moments of my life. And when you look at my body of work, it's just like a compilation of all these different experiences happening as it goes. And um, I feel like I'm pretty transparent in terms of the inspiration or why it is I do what I do. The whole idea was to talk about things that I care about personally that I don't typically get to talk about in outside life. In day-to-day -day life, I'm super quiet. I'm super reserved. I'm very introspective. I keep to myself. I stick to my routines. I go to the gym. I paint. I read. I write. I go to work. I spend time with very select few people. And most people don't even know I'm an artist unless someone else mentions it or someone else talks about it. And I say like, oh, like I like to draw too, or I like to paint. I don't feel like I need to draw attention to myself, but because I know that talking about it is the only way to connect to an audience, um, that's why I'm super vocal about the things that are happening in my life. In terms of the content of what I talk about, most of the things that I write, most of the things that I share, it's things that I wish I knew when I was just starting out. It's things that I 
are basically pieces of advice or wisdom or experiences that I'm like, I wish someone had told me this when I was first starting out. I wish I knew that it was possible to make a living from art. I wish it was possible to design a lifestyle that you get to decide how to spend your time with who and you know where to be, when you wanna to go to the bathroom, when you wanna eat, when you wanna sleep. Like having that unfettered freedom to decide what kind of paintings to make or what kind of music to listen to. Like that creative control is what I think drives me the most. And that's why I share pretty transparently. So yeah, when people have questions and they ask me here on Instagram live, I tell them, I don't, I'm not here to kind of go around the subject. I go pretty direct. Um, do you know if different mediums cost more? For example, is painting more expensive than oil painting more expensive than watercolor and ink? I would say yes, um, just because you need more products, but once you have the products, they're long lasting. And so you don't really need to keep spending money unless you're an addict and you're like, I need another brush. I need another tube of paint, which is very likely. Um, <laughs> I spend so much money on art products that I don't need, but I just keep doing it because I can't help myself. Um, but I also spend a lot of money on things that I do need like framing and canvases and turpentine and tape and shipping products and whatever. Um, oil paints are quite messy. If you're a messy painter, if you're not, it's pretty clean. Um, there's little things that you can do to make the process of painting as easy and as simple as possible. The more you complicate it, the more afraid you are of using the product. For instance, I had this fear of painting my entire life and I waited till I was 20 years old to paint. And I don't know why, but I did have that. What got me out of that was taking an art class and having someone say, Here's your painting palette. Here are the tubes of paint. Here are the brushes. This is turpentine, which previously I had no idea what it was. I just knew it was toxic. You pour this in a cup. This cleans your brushes. This is, and they said linseed oil. Linseed oil is a medium. A medium allows the paint flow to move more liquid-like. I don't use linseed oil. I use liquid. Liquid is a medium and it happens to dry the speed, speed up the drying time. An extra product. You have your painting palette, and then you have a canvas, and the canvas has to have gesso on it. Gesso is a product that you paint over the top of the canvas with the material, you let it dry, and once you've done a couple coats, it allows the surface to be ready for the paint. Paint is a toxic product, if you don't take care of the canvas, the oils will eat the product or the, the canvas over time. So that's why you prime wood panels. That's why you prime linen, canvas, whatever. Um, it sounds like maybe a lot to digest, but it's really, really simple. The scariest part is just taking the leap. It's that first step. It's that taking the paintbrush and putting it into the paint and then putting it onto the canvas. That's horrifying. And I don't know why it's horrifying, but it's like no one's ever ready to do something for the first time. But once you do it, you're like, that wasn't so bad. Like I didn't die. Like nobody got hurt. Um, I made an ugly painting. Oh, well, it happens. Um, but yeah, like that, that whole idea of stopping yourself before you even start, that's probably the biggest, biggest roadblock. Um, when it comes to painting versus drawing, for instance, you're like, oh my God, how am I supposed to use a paintbrush? I'm just trying to remember what I was thinking when I was starting out. I was like, how am I supposed to paint with this? Like I had a pencil or a pen and it's like, I know exactly where the mark is going, right? And then you give me this and I'm like, how do I, how do I, how do I apply the, where do I put it? Well, yes, there are big brushes to cover large, you know, portions of, of, uh, of the piece, but then there's brushes like this where it's like, yes, they're thick here, but they're thin at the very end. Or you have extreme detail brushes, which are like super tiny and thin, which is kind of like a pencil, 
each of them serves a different purpose. The more you use it, the more you understand what the purpose of that brush is for, what it can do, and the more you play with it, the more you understand what texture, what consistency it is, how they mix together, how the colors blend. Um, that just happens by doing it. But the more you live in this conceptual world of what can be or what won't be or what if I do this or what if I do that, that's time wasted that could have been spent getting your nose, you know, get your, getting your hands dirty um, and actually getting to work and producing. Um, hi, is, hi, your art is so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, perception of truth and reality. Yeah, I mean, we all live within a perception of what we think to be true. And so what's true to you isn't maybe true to me or vice versa. Um, art is kind of the same thing. It's like a really beautiful metaphor for life where it's like, it's a direct reflection of what you see around you. It's maybe not reality per se, but it's a reflection of reality. We're getting into like meta stuff, so I'll skip it. <laughs> Um, I've been depressed recently and to take my mind off of bad things in life, I draw and it makes me really happy when people like my art, I want to paint like you one day. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can definitely relate what that feels like. I know I've experienced depression in the past and so understanding that phase in my life and how I process my emotions and how certain experiences were traumatic and definitely took me down and had me living or reliving the same moments over and over again where I couldn't move past that. Um, trying to understand what those experiences were and how I could move through them and accept them and then um, either express them or uh, talk about them or use them to my benefit where it's like these things that are maybe sad or hard or difficult are for me moments these are things that maybe I didn't want to happen but it did so now it's like what am I going to do about it that's what I love about art is that art doesn't always have to be pretty it doesn't always have to be happy it can be whatever you want it to be um and art is this way where it's like you have all these emotions all these feelings and when you're in a depressed state when you're feeling sad sometimes we become attached to those feelings and it's really hard to let it go and so we get lost and we fall in love with the pain and the suffering and the anxiety and all these things and we keep experiencing these feelings on a daily basis and so something that was a really traumatic experience becomes a traumatic week which becomes a traumatic month year years whatever and then we carry these things like baggage and we put on you know, different masks for different people and we pretend, but the things that we have are still inside. Having art as a way to direct that, you know, those feelings, having art be a way to express what's inside here um, and be honest about it, it inadvertently takes away that pressure from your shoulders. It lets it be in something else and be on something else and so you don't have to carry that burden by yourself and when you see it on the canvas or when you see it in words or when you see it in a movie or in whatever creative process that you have you can see it from an outside perspective like an out-of-body experience where it's like it's no longer you it's you seeing the experience that happened to you or you seeing your pain or whatever the feeling that you have and now you get to decide how to feel about it it's like do you really want your life to be about this? Or are there other things that you also care about that you'd rather be doing? It doesn't make that process any less painful or difficult. It just means that you don't have to stay where you are if that's not really who you are. Um, depression isn't a genetic trait. It's a disease it's something that you can have you can catch and if you're not careful you don't cure it and it just lingers so when you find out that you have it or you realize that you have it when you realize that you're in a state of mind that's not really where you want to be now you have to figure out how to be happy and that's kind of the journey of everybody people require different levels of attention they require different experiences to move through those things Relationships can be beneficial, but they can also be harmful. So I think the relationship that you need to figure out is the one with yourself. And 
you have time to figure that out. So best of luck. And that was a weird train of thought. Do you feel the pressure to churn out content, perform, or please your audience to social media, even with your art like you have to make artworks that appeal to mass multitude to make money followers? It's a dance. Um, you tango. Uh, sometimes you compromise. How much you compromise is kind of a choice. Uh, it's not kind of, it is. You get to decide how unapologetic you're going to be. Are you going to be polite about it? Are you going to change your vocabulary in such a way where it's much more appealing or approachable? Or are you just going to be you 100%? That's up to you. Um, sometimes being you isn't always pretty. It's not always likable. It's not always approachable. And some people just get rubbed the wrong way and they're like, that's not for me. When you're trying to appeal to a larger audience and you try to appeal to everybody, you end up appealing to nobody. So it's kind of like figuring out who your audience is, creating this idea of a person in your head that you want to please, and then making that person be your entire audience. Like, I'm not trying to please, you know, Bob the Builder who loves building you know, buildings and building furniture, like I don't do that. So I don't create content for Bob. I create content for the artist who's trying to figure out their path, who's also trying to paint, or the creative who is on a journey of understanding how to navigate the world, both financially and also creatively, cr creatively, and like what tools and products to, to use to get to that place. Um, what knowledge they need to know to get to that place. And I try to share work that I think is honest work, work that I made with my heart and with attention, something that a piece of me got placed into it where it's like this becomes now an extension of me. So whether I'm in the room or not, you still see a bow piece of work. Um, that's kind of the goal. I created the Off the Grid collection. It was a series of portraits with landscapes. I created that because I was having health issues. Um, I went from being having two jobs to being unemployed, not being able to walk, um, being in chronic pain all the time, going into debt, and then having no passion, no purpose, no plan, and being like, what the fuck? So what did I do? I started digging deep. I started asking myself questions about who I am and what I want. And I tried out different things and they didn't work out. And then I tried fine art, tried painting. And the collection that I focused my attention on was the Off the Grid collection. The portraits are painted in black and white because at the time my life was devoid of color. And the landscapes that I painted within the face are representations of the places that shaped me, the places that I traveled to, the places that I'm reminiscing about, that I, that I long to travel to. And so the whole concept of that series was based around this longing for travel, for exploration, for wanderlust, because that's what I was feeling in that moment. I felt stuck in my own body and stuck in my own hometown and stuck in my life and I hated it. And so I just daydream about living this completely other life that maybe I used to live or maybe I want to live again or whatever. And that series, I pursued over a course of two years. Like I made a full recovery health-wise from the medication and proper treatment and all that. I got a full-time job, painted on the side and all that. And the state of mind that I was in creating that collection, that's not a state of mind that I'm in anymore. And so even though people expect me to create that series, they want me to create more portraits that are black and white with landscapes. I'm just not that person anymore. So right now I'm creating something completely different and I'm losing followers and I'm okay with it because I'm still making work for me first and foremost. If I can inspire someone else, if I can create something that someone else appreciates, it's a win-win, but I'm winning regardless of whether or not someone else likes it or not. That's a personal choice. Now, if I want to be a marketer and sell, 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 I did not make the right choice. But just because that choice, I didn't go that path, because I didn't go that path, I went a different path. The other path, what happens is maybe it's not, maybe this door closes, but because that door closes, another one opens, and now I'm walking through these doors, 
and these doors are leading to more doors that are opening for me. And so I'm opening up doors for myself based on my choices. Um, if I ever want to go back, I have that avenue. I know it works. I know it sells. That's great. Maybe I will. But right now I feel like this is something that I need to do. And so I'm going this way. <laughs> Uh, do you think you need the struggle and difficulty to make the journey and everything going on in your life worthwhile? Um, I think everyone loves a really, you know, hearty story, like a, a rags to riches or like a, like someone who went through extreme difficulty to get to the things that they want. I think people really appreciate that or really respect it, but it doesn't mean that it always has to be that way. Um, it doesn't mean that that's the only way to make it work. Some people are born into privilege. I feel like I was born into privilege. Like, yes, maybe I had certain aspects of my life not be ideal or not be to my own benefit, but I used what I had and I did what I could and I made what I wanted to make. That's something that no matter what class you come from, no matter what, you know, political, social, ethnic, whatever it is that you are, um, Never use that as an excuse or a crutch for why you're not succeeding. That's just avoiding looking in the mirror and being like, yo, I'm not actually working hard or yo, I'm not actually putting in the time or the effort. Maybe I'm hiding behind excuses to actually put myself in a position that does require risk, that does require effort, that does require extreme attention and focus. Um, Struggle is a great motivator and I think something that I've been thinking about lately and maybe I'm just ranting but um, I think death is one of the best motivators out there. I know it's not really a concept that you want to talk about on a daily basis. It's not really the most uplifting but it's the only one that I've found that really gets you to wake up. It's like how how can I get or how can I wake up every day and be present? How can I show up and actually want to be where I am and not want to be anybody else but me and not want to be anywhere else but here? When you're stuck in a grind, when you're stuck in a routine, when people are pushing you along, when people are pulling you along, you're on autopilot. You're not even there anymore. You don't see the consequences of your actions. You don't see what happens um, if you stay on this path because you already feel like you know what's going to happen. Every day is a new day. Every day is different than yesterday. Even though it may seem similar, even though you may do very similar things, like may have similar conversations, you're a completely different person than the person you were yesterday. And yet we act the same way as we did yesterday because we have to honor tradition or honor you know, the person that you think you are. When you realize that your time is limited, that life isn't always going to be like this, like you're not always going to be this young, you're not always going to be this energetic, you're not always going to be pain-free or, you know, stress-free or this or that, like things can go wrong. Things will go wrong. Um, you're going to lose people around you. You're going to be affected by disaster. Um, you're going to get a phone call that you just don't want to have. So while you're in a state where you're able, where you're clear headed, where you have the time and the energy and the money, this is the time to do it. This is the time to take the risk, to, to pursue your dreams, to make the things that you care about, to create a life for yourself that's worthwhile for you on your own terms. Um, because some people don't have that privilege. Some people don't have that opportunity. So if you have that chance and you choose not to take it, you're letting yourself down. Um, and you're letting the people around you down because you're not showing them what a leader is, what an example is, what's possible. And sometimes you just need someone else to sh tell you that like, yo, like you are an artist. Like you're, you're drawing, you're painting, you're creating things that you love. Like you are an artist. Sometimes it's, we're the last ones to accept ourselves your last ones to see ourselves for who we are it takes an outside perspective to get you out of that it's their hero's journey um sometimes that person comes in the shape of a mentor sometimes it, they come in the shape of a helper 
of a friend, of a disaster, you know, something that wakes you up from being asleep and saying like, actually, you need to wake up and you need to take your life into your own hands. Another long rant by Bo Frank. <laughs> um, for example, does oil painting price higher to sell other than other mediums? It's all relative. Um, I'd say oil paints fetches a higher price point than acrylics, fetches a higher price point than watercolors, but there are watercolor artists that are making more than oil painters and vice versa. Um, yeah. Madeline McGreen Gittler. Hey, welcome to my aquarium. Do the auctions actually work for you? Like how do you know if the people who bid are reliable? LOL, just curious because it's an interesting way of selling your art. I spent the last three years developing an audience of people who I would want to hang out with. People that are like-minded, people that care about the arts, that care about creativity, that care about photography and travel and architecture and design and food and pretty much cool, nice people that I like. I try to regularly share work that would be interesting to those people. Something that we could start developing a relationship, even though it's virtual, it comes across as being personal. I share things about me that I don't really share with everybody and yet I'm still doing that because I feel like it's important to have these conversations and it's important for me to have these conversations and not keep it inside. So I share that. Because of those conversations, because of the content that I'm sharing, I've created a community of people that respect me, appreciate me, and whether they like my work or not, they still have respect. However, because I work at my practice, because I paint on a daily basis, because I care about what I do, I try to create quality content. This quality content is what has attracted the followers that I have it's what attracted the collector base that I have. It's what attracted the people that are engaging with these auctions to purchase my work. Some people, like the people that are trying to buy my work, some are friends, some are family members, some are people that I know. And then there's this whole other pe group of people that I have no idea who they are. And I'm like, wait, you're not my aunt. And you're not, you have no reason to support me. You have no reason to help me. You have no reason to buy my work. Why would you want to do that? And it's like, wait a second. Actually, I've been showing up every single day for the last three years. And they've been seeing that journey. They've been seeing my progress. They see that I care. They see that I'm going somewhere. Plus, they like my work. They're like, this is the time to own a Beau Bernier Frank piece at an affordable price. Hells yeah, I'm gonna buy this piece. Hells yeah, I'm gonna outbid this lady. Hells yeah, I'm gonna beat this you know middle school kid who's on the other side of the planet. People start bidding against each other. They wanna buy a piece. They wanna support me. They wanna have that actual art in their house because they like the art. I can't create that for you. You have to create that for yourself. And that's something that takes time, that takes discipline, that takes practice. But it's possible. Um, it's possible super possible um but it's not an overnight success it's something that you curate um yes i've been thinking about that lately as well if you try to please everyone it's easy to get lost because you have a little bit of everything and not a lot of one talent aka your purpose in life yeah and the whole idea of like purpose and all that like pri i think it's more like priority um Purpose is such a heavy burden. It's like, this is who you are. This is who you're always going to be. But priority is like, priorities change. Like one day, this is the most important thing in your life. The next thing, this is the most important thing in your life. The next thing, this is the most important thing in your life. And it evolves. It grows. It condenses. It contracts. It shifts. Like the list gets smaller. It gets bigger. More responsibilities. More things to juggle. Things get bumped up and down. Um... But yeah, the whole idea is to please yourself. So depending on what you decide to put at the top of your list, make sure that whatever that is, it's making you happy. That's what matters. So should artists nowadays have to be clever social marketing strategists to succeed now? Do you think there are plenty of great talents out there that are not getting enough attention because they're not online? You decide what to do. Um, 
you have these tools in front of you. These are opportunities that may not last. It may just be a season, who knows. If you're not gonna use it, if you don't want that, great. I'm just gonna take your slice and I'm gonna keep it for myself and I'm gonna eat your side of the cake. Um, it's not the only way. People are doing the traditional route and it's working for them and I'm really envious actually. I think that's great. Um, but I actually like this whole aspect of connecting, of sharing, of video content, of Instagram Live, of auctions or whatever. These are things that didn't exist before. So it's like, why not try? Why not see how it goes? Um, um, you have inspired me so much to major art when I go to college. Yeah, as I would say as long as you're making art, no matter what shape or form that is, I think that's important if that's what you love. Uh, just make sure that you don't go into debt to be able to do the thing that you love if it's something that's gonna put you so far into debt that you won't be able to get out of. Um, as an artist, the first few years, it's a lot of investing and you don't make the art money back until later. So just be careful about it. All right, guys, it's been an hour. There is 20 seconds left in this Instagram Live. It's been super engaging. Thanks for letting me word vomit. Thanks for letting me talk about art and philosophy and these things that I care about. Um, there'll be hopefully some more to come soon. Thanks for watching. Love you guys. Have a wonderful night. Bye. So that was the first Instagram Live video that I shared. Um, it was an hour long, so I know it's quite intense. A lot of subjects discussed. Um, a lot that could have been expanded on or maybe made a little bit more short. I know I definitely rambled on a couple times, but I felt like this was one of those really important videos that needed to be shared, needed to be put out in the world and some and have access to uh, by artists. So if you like this video, if you appreciate it, if this was something that you found beneficial to you in your practice, then please subscribe, please hit like, share it with a friend, and just keep on making the things that you care about. Keep on sharing the work that you care so much about because the world needs more of that. So thanks for joining, thanks for watching. You can find more of my work at bobernyfrank.com. You can follow me also on Instagram at bobyfrank. Otherwise, I also do these little uh, six inch by six inch auctions at six by six auction. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon.